Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are so excited uh, today, tonight, to be teaching about the new month. We're about to embark on the month of Cheshvan. Uh, we want to begin with Genesis 1 and verse 14. Uh, here we also, uh, we're in the month of Breshit. Uh, Heshvan and Breshit always seem to go together. Well, here we are. Listen to Genesis 1:14. God speaking about the creation of the sun and the moon. And God says, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. And the whole purpose, it says, is to divide the day from the night. And then he says, let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. I think it's so important to note that the first reason God said he created the sun and the moon was for signs. What signs are there that the sun and the moon can give us other than eclipses? That's why the solar and lunar eclipses are so tied to God's calendar. And when he says he also gave it to us for seasons, that has nothing to do with winter, spring, summer, or fall. The Hebrew word is moed, and it means for the divine appointments that God has ordained according to his calendar. Well, the new moon, which is the start of every biblical month, is the most pivotal date on a biblical calendar, because without the new moon, we would never know when any of the biblical holidays were to be kept. Uh, it is known as Rosh Chodesh, okay, or the sanctification of the new moon, and this tells us which days will be holy in any given month. Now, we know the Bible in Genesis begins with the tree of life. Well, guess what? Here in Genesis 2, 9, it says, Out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, at the end of the book, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1 and 2, we find the tree of life again. It says, he showed me a river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on this side of the river and on that side was the tree of life. And look at this. It bare 12 different kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. That means the new fruit would be appearing every new moon. So... And when it says every month, it's not referring to January or February. It's referring to the biblical months. Now, what about during the millennial reign? When Messiah rules and reigns for a thousand years, we know that hasn't started yet. Will we be keeping the new moon? Well, look at what it says in Ezekiel chapter 46 and verse 1. Thus says the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that looks toward the east will be shut six working days. But on the Sabbath day, it will be opened and on the day of the new moon. So we see that the Sabbath will be kept all through the millennial reign as well as the new moon. But how will it be known when a month is over during the Olam Haba or eternity after the thousand year reign, new heavens, new earth? Are we still going to celebrate the new moon then after the millennial reign? Well, let's look at Isaiah. This is chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so your seed and your name will remain. And then it says this. This is about after the new heavens and the new earth. It says it will happen that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh will come to worship before me, says the Lord. Wow. So even in eternity, there will still be a heaven, an earth, a sun, and a moon, and we will come and seek the Lord. So uh, I think it's amazing to me that the Lord created the sun, the sun, the moon, these uh, orbs for signs. As a matter of fact, listen to Psalms 104, verse 19 through 21. God says he made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows his going down. You make darkness and it is night wherein all the beasts of the forest are creeping forth and the young lions are roaring after their prey and they're seeking their food from God. Wow. God made the moon to mark the seasons. 
as referring not to winter, spring, summer, fall again here. It's referring to the appointed times when God is going to intersect human history. And then let's look at Psalm 81, verse 3 and 4. It says, blow the shofar at the new moon, at the full moon for our feast day, for it is a statute for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. Uh, with that said, let me step over here. And we're going to grab the shofar, and I will blow the shofar, or I will try to blow the shofar. We blew the shofar. There we go. We're to blow the shofar at the new moon. Well, get a load of Psalms uh, 81, 3, and 4, where it says, blow the horn at the new moon for the full moon at our feast day. Well, guess why? It's all about God's covenant with King David. Listen to Psalm 89, verse 20. God says, I found David my servant, with my holy oil, I anointed him with whom my hand will be established. My arm also will strengthen him. And then it goes on to say this in Psalm 89, verse 23 and 24. And I will beat to pieces his adversaries before him, smite them that hate him. And then God says, my faithfulness and my mercy will be with him. And through my name, his horn shall be exalted. As a matter of fact, it goes on to say in verse 28 and 29, Forever will I keep for him my mercy. My covenant will stand fast with him. His seed will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. And then it concludes with this. Listen to verse 33 through 37. God says, nevertheless, my loving kindness, I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. God says, my covenant I won't break. I won't alter the word that's gone out of my lips. Once I've sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed will endure forever. His throne as the sun before me, it'll be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. We see the sun and the moon are God's heavenly witnesses in the sky. And it also says David, who's from the tribe of Judah, his seed will endure forever. The Jews are not going away. As a matter of fact, look at Jeremiah 33, verse 25 and 26. God says, if my covenant is not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, only then will I cast away the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant. In other words, it isn't happening. The Jews will always be God's people. As a matter of fact, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, God told Moses that the month of Nisan is now to be the beginning of the months. It'll be the first month of the year to you. That is to the nation of Israel. Now, when it comes to the sanctification of the moon, okay, do we make ourselves holy or does God make us holy? Well, if we make us holy, it's not holy to God. It's holy to whatever we make ourselves holy to. Only God can make us holy to him. Uh, listen to Leviticus 20. Verse 7 and 8, it says, Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and I want you to keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Okay? This is why uh, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26, it goes on to say, God says, You are to be holy to me, for I am the Lord who is holy, and I separated you from the people that you would be mine. So God separates us and makes us holy, then our job is to stay holy. Uh, in Leviticus 18.30, it says, Therefore you shall keep my charge that you do not do any of these abominable customs which are done before you, that you don't defile yourselves. I am the Lord your God. So with that said, uh, let's stand and let's say the prayers for the sanctification of the new moon. Uh, together. May it be your will, Lord our God and God of our fathers, that you begin for us this month for good and for blessing. May you give to us long life, a life of peace, a life of goodness, a life of blessing, a life of substance, a life of physical health, a life in which there is a fear of heaven uh, and a fear of sin, a life in which there is no shame or humiliation, a life of wealth and honor, a life in which we love Torah and fear God, a life in which the Lord fulfills his, uh, fulfills the requests of our hearts for good. Amen.
Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who created the skies by your word and all of heaven's hosts with the breath of your mouth. You gave them appointed times and roles, and they never missed their cues. Doing their creator's bidding with gladness and joy, you are the true creator who acts faithfully and has told the moon to renew itself. It is a beautiful crown for the people of Israel who are carried by God from birth and who will likewise be renewed in the future in order to proclaim the beauty of their creator for his glorious majesty. Blessed are you, O Lord, who renews new moons. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who sanctified us by your commandments and commanded us to be a light to the nations and has given us Yeshua, our Messiah, the light of the world. Amen. You can sit down. I just got a few minutes. I just want to share a little bit about the month of Heshvan and its meaning. Uh, every tribe of the 12 tribes, each was given a certain month that belonged to them. And Heshvan belonged to the tribe of Manasseh. Now, what do we know? Uh, we know that Cain and Abel did not get along. We know that Jacob and Esau did not get along. Do you know Ephraim and Manasseh were the first two brothers in the Bible to get along? Manasseh excelled in things of the world, working side by side with Joseph in Pharaoh's court. And Ephraim, he excelled in spiritual matters. Manasseh helped Joseph in the administration of the affairs in Egypt, while Ephraim would spend his time studying Torah and spiritual matters. Uh, much like, if you remember, in the blessings, uh, the brothers Zebulun and Issachar teamed up. And uh, some people ask, well, why did Jacob cross his hands rather than have Manasseh move to the other side? If you remember, uh, here, this is my right hand, uh, this is my left hand. And Joseph had put Manasseh over here to be blessed with the right hand, and Ephraim was over here, okay? And then Jacob reached over, crossed his hands to bless Ephraim first, and Joseph said, no, 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 you need to put it over here on Manasseh. He's at your right. Well, uh, the sages thought, well, how come he did that? Why didn't he just tell Ephraim Manasseh to swap and put Ephraim over here and do it this way? Uh, rather than crossing his hands. Well, that's very interesting. Well, they say he wanted Manasseh to stay at his right hand because he did realize Manasseh truly was the firstborn, so he got to stay at the right hand. But he also, Manasseh was to receive primarily earthly blessings and still have some spiritual insights, whereas Ephraim was to receive mostly the spiritual blessings with some earthly insight. Uh, what do we find from Genesis chapter 50, verse 23? Joseph, he saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. That means Joseph got to see his great-grandchildren. That's amazing. It, it uh, defines one of them as the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh. He was even brought up on Joseph's knees. Well, Reuben and Gad... Uh, they did not want the promised land, okay? Moses ordered the half-tribe of Manasseh to go. If you remember, the other side of the promised land was Reuben Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. But no, that half-tribe of Manasseh was not wanting to go there. They were ordered to go there by Moses. Uh, let's look at this. Uh, and in Numbers chapter 32, verse 39 and 40, concerning Machir, the son of Manasseh, look at this. And the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead, took it, and dispossessed the Amorite which was in it. And Moses gave Gilead unto Machir, the son of Manasseh, and he dwelt there. Okay, why did Moses put half of the tribe of Manasseh over there? Well, Moses wanted both leadership and Torah study to be available to them through the tribe of Manasseh. Uh, Reuben and Gad are there. They may know a little bit about cattle and sheep, but they don't know a whole lot about governing things. So Manasseh, who excelled in governmental structures, that tribe was to go over and help. But they also had some spiritual insight as well. As a matter of fact, listen to this in Judges chapter 5, verse 14. It says, Out of Ephraim was there a root of them who came against Amalek, and from Benjamin among your people. And then look at this. Out of Machir came down governors. So here, Machir, who's from Manasseh, has governors. This is governmental administration. But not only that, that word governor, which implies leader, ruler, 
and legislators. In other words, the tribe of Manasseh were legislators knowing how to interpret Torah law. That's incredible. So the other interesting thing about Manasseh, as we said, mostly he looked like he was outwardly very smart from a administrative point of view. You couldn't really see inside all of his Torah spiritual insights. Well, it just so happens on top, I have the word Manasseh. And do you know if you switch the letters around, uh, oops, what do you get? Neshama, which is soul or spirit. And so hidden within Manasseh, is a very spiritual soul, a very godly person. Now, concerning the month of Cheshvan, okay, uh, there are no festivals in this month, uh, but important things did happen in this month. Uh, like Methuselah, get a load of this, Rachel also died on the 11th of Cheshvan, which was also the day Benjamin was born. Uh, Abraham's wife Sarah also died in the month of Cheshvan. In 1 Kings 6.38, we find Solomon's temple was completed in the month of Cheshvan. We know it was dedicated in the month of Tishri. So that means Solomon, after it was completed, waited almost an entire year before he would dedicate it. Now, here's something else that I find uh, fascinating. Uh, at the top is Noah's name, Noach. Now, we know Heshvan is when the flood took place. And here at the top is Noach, which is Noah's name. And it says Noah found what? Grace in God's sight. That's why he was spared. Well, it's interesting. You take Noah's name and you flip it. You get Ken, which is grace. So even in times of judgment, like I brought out earlier, Jeroboam building the calf right before the election and then the flood right after the election, we know there will be grace for God's people. And guess what? We are now in the month of Cheshvan, which is the bottom word in this slide. And guess what? The very month of Cheshvan, which is the month of judgment, the first letter is the Chet, the last letter is the Nun, which means grace. So there is always grace, even in the midst of the chaos. So it's a month of judgment, and grace surrounds it. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is the similarities between the number one, the number eight, and the 50, uh, the number 50. Uh, as we know, there's the Shemitah cycles. There, you know, every seven years is the Shemitah cycle. Well, just like uh, the notes in music, the eighth note is the first note. And it's the same thing. Uh, if you're going like counting one through 50, you have one through seven. Well, the eighth year is also the first year of the next Shemitah cycle. So you can see the tie-in between one and eight. Well, what about one, eight, and 50? Well, you also know after the seven Shemitah years, that next year is a first year of a Shemitah cycle. It's the eighth year after the previous Shemitah seven-year cycle, but it's also the year of Jubilee, which is the 50th year. Now, we know Heshvan is the eighth month of the calendar, uh, which is the, this the first full month uh, also of the Jubilee year when Messiah remains. When you think about it, uh, Messiah, the first complete month of his reign will be in a year of Jubilee, which will be the first month of a new cycle. It'll also be the eighth month because when he arrives at Tishri, there's only half a month left. Uh, and then we also know that 50 numerically in Hebrew is the letter noon. All right. And the amazing thing about uh, the letter noon is it speaks both of eternity. It speaks of redemption and it speaks of resurrection. Amazing things about the month of Heshvan. Uh, with that said, let's stand and we will close with the priestly blessing. And may you enjoy this next new month. Ivarekaka Adonai Vaish Mareka, Yaer Adonai Panav Ilaka Vichuneka, Yisa Adonai Panav Ilaka Vyasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Aye Asher Aye. Amen. We'll see you again next month. Be blessed. <laughs>